to see you all here today. Uh, welcome to this information session on residential solar electricity generation. So those of you who are here for the art class, wrong room. Okay. The session is sponsored by the Solar Committees of Chadwick Square and Walden Fields Townhouse Developments. My name is Reese Satton. The purpose of this session is to provide you accurate information about the benefits and issues raised in permitting solar power generation of residential electricity in a townhouse context. To this end, we have a presentation by a person knowledgeable on the subject, as well as an opportunity for you to ask questions related to the topic. To help answer these questions, we have several individuals from the town, and we'll be joined by someone from the fire district. We'll start by a presentation by Steve Anderson, Steve Anderson. <laughs> Steve has training in solar energy and volunteers with community groups to support their exploration of solar power. And we, which is to say Lorraine Del Belso, found him at the Del Mar Farmer's Market. <laughs> <laughs> Following Steve's presentation, anyone wishing to ask a question about the presentation or solar uh, electricity generation can come to that microphone. We ask that your questions address issues specific, not address issues specific to a particular development, but in general. In order to answer all questions and provide everyone an opportunity to get the answers they need, we ask that you ask only one question each time you come to the microphone and that the question be relevant to the topic. You're invited to return to ask additional questions after others have had the opportunity. We anticipate that some of your questions will be about building code compliance and fire safety. For that reason, we have asked Justin Harbinger, head building inspector for the town of Bethlehem, and Jim Regan, chief of the Ellesmere Fire District. Feel free to address appropriate questions to them. Our moderator today is Bill Reinhardt. Bill has a master's in city and regional planning and one in energy management and policy. He has more than 30 years of experience in energy environment, agriculture, and hydrogen technology. Bill worked for 26 years at the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA, most recently as senior project manager. Until his retirement from NYSERDA in 2010, uh, I'm sorry, and recently as program manager until his retirement from NYSERDA in 2010. In November of uh, 2012, Bill was elected to the Bethlehem Town Council, where he continues to pursue his goals of energy efficiency and renewable energy development as part of a sustainable sustainability strategy for economic development in the context of our changing global climate. And so, who better to moderate the question period? Right now, uh, Steve Anderson will give you his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reese. Is this about the right volume for everybody? Can you hear me in the back? Yes. So I really appreciate the offer uh, to come here. And more importantly, I'd like to congratulate you all on having this meeting. And I'll, uh, I'll explain that um, as we go forward here. So this, is, this meeting is really an opportunity in at least three different dimensions. Um, one is an opportunity to learn about solar electric energy. Um, the other is an opportunity to share your concerns and issues, and that's really the reason I want to congratulate you. This industry is in its formative stages. Um, there are few black and white answers, 
There are many um, issues and questions in the field that are evolving over time. So this opportunity to talk together as a community, to clarify values, and come to a common understanding of our common needs, for example, to maintain the value of our residences, to maintain a sense of aesthetics that's desirable to the community, as well as safe and, re and sound and, and reasonably priced energy are all very relevant. So I congratulate you on this meeting. And then we'll look at an opportunity to identify next steps. I threw some next steps on um, out of my head that I dreamt up, but it's really for you as uh, one or two separate communities to uh, decide those together. So this is some of the things we're going to be going over. Um, if I don't kill myself, wrapped up in the wire here. Um, and, uh, who, why, why am I standing up here? You know, I'll share some of that in, in a few seconds. Types of solar energy. If we only refer to solar, it can be a little ambiguous, so we'll zero in on that very quickly. We'll actually look at how does solar energy work. You know, how do electrons come out of boxes that look like this over here? Um, the useful life of a, of a system. Um, financial considerations. We'll go through uh, sample uh, calculations, including government incentives. Up here, uh, we'll look at the steps involved in a customary installation. There are several steps, and they can take from a few weeks to over a year. So we we'll want to understand better that if one does want to go forward, in what order or what steps likely to happen. We're going to really focus on risks and concerns. There are risks and concerns, including fire hazards. So that's the reason why towns and municipalities have regulations around this technology. And we will look at benefits. There are different benefits um, for different people. Um, there's a portfolio of benefits that are possible, but not necessary for everyone in every situation. Um, and then we'll go to questions in the next steps. So very uh, briefly, you know, why am I up here? Um, as Reese mentioned, I was found at the Del Mar Farmers Market. <laughs> so after I left the corporate world, I had an opportunity to take a, an early leave, which I uh, greatly appreciated. I um, went to Hudson Valley Community College, which I think is the next bullet point here, and I took their Workforce Development Institute course in um, solar electric energy, photovoltaics. And I'm so interested in that um, that I'm working with a couple of communities like the city of Troy, the city of Albany, um, and open to other groups to help them explore possibilities of expanding renewable energy. And in doing that, I know Paul Tech, you know, one of the founders of the Del Mar Farmers Market, and I thought perhaps the audience there would be interested in this subject. So I said, Paul, can I set up a solar information table about that big and kind of go over the same, some of the abbreviated version of what we're going to do today. What does it look like? How does it work? What does it cost? And voila, Lorraine came up and found me. Um, after the course at Hudson Valley, I passed the North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners entry level exam, which is like a four hour exam. Um, and significant level of detail, so that means I know how to spell solar. Um, I mentioned supporting the city of Troy. Um, I served in the Green Sanctuary Committee for the Unitarian Universalist Church in Albany, who recently made a decision to put solar on their roof. And uh, lastly, I want to say up front that I have an association with Allura Solar Company in Schenectady. Um, I'm not here to sell. I don't have their card. I'm not going to mention other than this anything about the company. But it's a benefit to me and I think therefore to you because it gives me a connection to the industry itself on a week to week basis. So I've been on a few roofs. I know the feeling of connecting wires, of safety requirements on the roof, and that's what allows me to do that. Um, so types of solar, just briefly. Um, solar electric is what we're going to be focusing on and it produces electricity. A typical size of a panel is five to six feet long, three um, and a half feet wide and uh, a couple inches deep. So over here, um, here's, a, here's a demo version and here's the actual panel. Wait a minute, maybe that's the other way around. There's the demo and that's the actual solar panel over there and when you come up later, um, you can get a sense if you want, you know, how much it, it weighs, et cetera, and stand next to it. 
Now, um, before, I'm going to show plenty of pictures on what these actually look like on a roof. And there are many variations of this. Like, for example, the color of the, um, the rim, the foundation, the shape of the, of the cells inside. But that's, that's a good representative. Um, over here, solar thermal. That's another technology which creates heat, largely to heat your hot water, um, domestic hot water needs. Um, from the sun, and the typical panel size is definitely bigger, you know, 10 feet long by 4 feet wide by 3 and a half inches deep or so. But we won't be talking about solar or thermal today, except in one picture I snuck one in. Um, so some people say when we start talking about solar that we can't do it in New York or Northeast U.S., it's too cloudy. Well, I just wanted to give you a, a representative map here. I believe this, this comes from... AMREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, a federal agency. And it's focusing on the US, but it has uh, one country over here, a subset in this window, that I want to focus on, and that's Germany. So Germany has more solar energy incorporated into its grid, into its municipal energy supply, than any country in the world. And the color purple represents a level of solar irradiation in this spectrum over here, which is lower than any place in the United States except for Alaska and parts of uh, Portland, Oregon. So in other words, solar energy is viable basically any place in the United States. The only thing you're talking about is to produce the same amount of energy, electricity in New York as you would in the Southwest where it's very red high solar radiation, you might need uh, some more panels or higher power output panels, but it's still viable. So if we look at how energy solar um, photoelectric systems work, you actually have a cell, um, and when the sun or solar radiation hits the cell, electrons flow in one direction out of the cell, and they're accumulated between the different cells. So I'm going to show you over here just a little bit more. It might be hard to see from uh, all the way back there, but basically this is a square cell, and you'll see two lines going down through the, the cell, um, and all these are, are wires, basically flat wires that go over and under each of these cells all the way down, and when you come up afterwards, how come I can't get closer? Oh, I guess that's my limit. Um, when you come up afterwards, you're going to see where the wires are accumulated at the end of the panel. So the voltage and amperage is added up between all of those cells. And then when you connect different panels together on your roof to um, form a string, a, a collection of cells, the voltage and amperage increases more to meet the requirements of your household. So that's kind of in the nutshell why there's a fire hazard and um, safety hazard with solar panels on your roof. You are dealing with voltages and amperages that match the needs of the electricity in your home, <clears throat> which can be substantive, excuse me. Oh, gracious. I thought I'd uh, last another few minutes before I needed water. <clears throat> So this is a real high level um, description of a, a solar panel installation. We're not gonna get into details, but I wanna point out a couple of items. When we talk about solar photovoltaic energy, lots of the times, what do we focus on? You know, the, the panels on top of the house, but there's more to it. The panels on top of the house don't magically get electricity into your lights in your refrigerator. So the electricity from those, uh, that array now, so you have, you have cells in a panel. Panels are connected in a string. Strings are connected in an array. So you have an array on your house which feeds direct current electricity. The sun, those panels produce direct DC current it's collected here into a DC disconnect box. It's converted to AC by something called an inverter. And that inverter in turn has a disconnect, which has a production meter so that you can tell how much energy, how much electricity your solar array is making, which is then connected into the house and 
your, here's your utility meter that um, most, probably most of us are on national grid. That's what tells national grid how much, up until this point in time, up until the point in time that you have a solar system, it tells national grid how much electricity you're, you're using. As soon as you install a solar array on your house, National Grid comes along and replaces the meter that you currently have on your house, a one-way meter, with a two-way meter. So that they can tell when you're producing more electricity from the sun than you need, it tells National Grid how much electricity you're feeding back into their system. And when you're using electricity from the grid because you're not producing it from the solar array, like when? At night time, and when your solar panels are covered with snow, um, then National Grid knows how much electricity you're using from their system. Now this, I'm just gonna sweep through, but the reason it's up here, and all of the detail, you know, AC, hot, neutral, ground, all the combinations, combiner boxes, charge controllers, breaker panels, it is, it's not a good idea to do this yourself. Um, you know, I can remember in, in the old days when, you know, homesteader types or Mother Earth news types, um, and even now I've heard some people saying, well, why don't I just save money, buy some candles, and throw it on the roof yourself? Well, one reason I've already mentioned is dangerous. If you, if you don't connect these wires right, if you use the wrong kind of uh, uh, wire size, the wrong kind of nuts and bolts to connect them, you don't put them on your house right, etc., it's dangerous. The other thing is um, you won't get any incentives or grants unless you use a vendor who is certified and authorized to do this. So useful system life. Now I'm going to focus on the two aspects of a, a solar system that I mentioned already. The panels themselves and the inverter. Those are two key systems. The balance of system, the BOS what they call it, is the nuts and bolts and wires and connectors and the attacher, attachments to your roof, et cetera. But these are two key aspects. So solar panels, the, generally the warranty life is 25 years. Now we're gonna talk about warranties more because if anyone's actually interested in pursuing this, warranties are a key issue. You need to understand, you, you don't need to, but you want to understand. I would propose that you do understand the warranties associated with any products you get because the warranties will vary. Um, so warranty life is generally 25 years on the power output of the piano. Remember that, on the power output of the piano. Um, the lifespan though is actually estimated up to 40 years and there are systems in place that are 50, 60, and 70 years old and more. Some installations longer. The inverters, the, the most uh, uh, used type of inverter is a central inverter. And as you have your array up there and there's one box in the basement, which is your inverter. And its life, and look at this. Its warranty life is 10 to 15 years. What does that tell you? You know, if the estimated life of the panels is 25 to 40 years, warranty life 25 years, central inverters 10 to 15 years, there's a good chance that you'll need at least one inverter replacement in, during the lifespan of your estimated lifespan of your system. However, more and more microinverters are coming into play. We'll talk about a little bit more about microinverters, the advantages and disadvantages. Their life warranty lifespan is a little bit more, 20 to 25 years, um, and it's uh, you know more similar than uh, to the panels themselves. Financial considerations. So is it bigger than a bread box? Um, you know, are we talking hundreds, thousands, millions of dollars? Well, let's let's look at this really simple, high-level estimate of, of a 5 kW system. So a 5kW system is a small end of a typical residence. The typical residence might be 7kW, 8kW. A large residential installation is 12kW, really large with two hot tubs and lots of uh, energy using items is like 15kW. Um, right off the top from NYSERDA, the current rebate is a dollar per watt. Now, I, could, I say underline current, because that changes three or four times a year. 
Exerta will come in and they're modifying um, that rebate amount. And which direction do you think they're going? Upwards or downwards? Down. 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 So two or three, I don't think four times a year, the NYSERDA is coming in and ratcheting down that rebate amount. I think last September the rebate was a buck twenty-five or a buck thirty. In January they changed it to a dollar. We are in March now. Guess what might happen around April or so? Um, and the reason they're going down is the whole purpose of the rebate here is to make solar energy more on par, cost on par, with the you know, energy that you get from the grid. So is the cost of panels and other solar system um, parts are going down, NYSERDA says, well, our rebate can go down in order to achieve the same cost to the customer. So that's the rationale for decreasing the NYSERDA rebate, which is currently at a dollar. So out of a $25,000 system, the rebate from um, NYSERDA would be $5,000. You see I'm using nice round numbers for the example. But they're still within the ballpark. You won't see that $5,000. The vendor that you select to install the system that applies for the system, that rebate will go right to them. So that you will be left with a contract amount of $20,000. That would be your obligation. Now, the key things to keep in mind is you have a possibility. Now, I say underline possibility. So you have available to you a New York State tax credit of 25% or up to $5,000 to apply against your uh, solar system. And a federal tax credit of 30% with no upper limit. So you have the possibility of achieving uh, over five years an $11,000 tax credit against that system. So that if, underline if, you need to work with your tax accountant. I study solar energy, not accounting. You really have to take responsibility for this on your own because you see I'm repeating it three or four times. Some people get stuck. Um, some people say, oh, I'm going to get that. Oh, I shouldn't do that. Some people uh, say, I'm going to get $11,000, and really all I have to worry about is $9,000. Uh -uh. If your tax appetite um, does not accommodate that $11,000 over five years, you owe $20,000. So you really, before you sign on the bottom line, you need to work with your financial advisor to make sure that you have this tax appetite or adjust in your mind the planning around the final cost that um, you need to or you need to be responsible for. Now let's look at some financing options. The, the two simple ones here are you either buy it or you lease it. And if you've been keeping your um, eye on the, the industry journals and the advertising and whatever, leasing is becoming incredibly increasingly popular. Why is that? Lowers keep up your what was it? It lowers your yearly cost. Uh, lowers the yearly cost, yes. What else? What's the what's change, change, change in technology. Change in technology, yes. There's another key one that a lot of people like. Low investment. Initial cost. Low investment up front. That low investment would be zero. Up to zero up front, it costs you to lease a system and get it on your on your house. I like that idea, huh? Okay, so um, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages? Well, it turns out to be a little similar to uh, leasing versus buying a car. Um, so if, to lower your cost over the lifetime of the system in place, so that we're talking about a car or the solar system, purchasing is basically almost always the way to go. Especially if you have that tax appetite um, um, and you can take advantage of that, you're going to pay for that system in, well, it depends on your actual situation, between 6 and 8 and 12 years. That's generally the payback on one of these systems. And after that, you put all savings directly in your pocket. Um, <clears throat> with a lease, you are generally signing a contract for 15 to 20 years. And uh, at, at less than, you would pay National Grid in this case, so your monthly utility bill for electricity to the owner of 
the solar system on your roof is really providing you electricity now. It just happens to be a solar system on the roof. It's less than you pay national grid. They're probably paying that off because they're a business. Um, they have depreciation this expenses too that they can discount. They're probably paying that system off in yeah, four to six years, maybe eight years at the, at the outset. And after eight years, they're taking all the money and sticking it directly in their pocket. So companies usually love leases because it's profitable for them. Um, it's more profitable for you as an individual to own it if you can. And there are certain circumstances where um, purchasing just doesn't work. Like I mentioned, I was working with a Unitarian Universalist church, or basically any church, any non-for-profit organization. They can't receive the tax incentives, right? They're non-for-profits. So their only option really was to lease. Another advantage of leasing, in addition to the zero upfront cost, is uh, many, if not all, of the leasing companies will take com completely re responsibility for maintenance um, and monitoring of the system. So that we'll see later on, one of the key things you need to do after you get a solar system on your roof, if you do, is to monitor the output of that electricity. Remember back, let's see, it shouldn't be too far back here. This guy here, the, pro oh shoot, the wrong button. This guy here, the production meter, you're going to want to look at this production meter and make sure that your solar array is producing um, what its design capacity is. Because if it's not, um, that indicates some kind of problem. Um, and what could a problem be? Uh, maybe a little squirrel decides to build a nest underneath one of your solar panels. Maybe a wire comes loose, whatever. There's a unlikely but possible um, circumstances that would cause a problem. You need to monitor, a leasing company will generally monitor that and then resolve any issues. As a matter of fact, a good leasing company will not only monitor it, they'll tell you there's a problem and be on site before you might even know about it. Um, so those are some pros and cons of purchasing and leasing. So we talked about some uh, possible steps involved in um, a, a typical investigation and then installation of a, a solar system. And here are some of them. Some, the order can change you know, uh, some of these, but uh, you won't find that um, the estimate will come before the operation. So generally, information gathering and education. This is one that is really variable. This can take uh, a, a customer like yourselves, like myself, anywhere from a few weeks, literally, to a few months, and even over a year. And because I have the association with Allura and I've been on the selling end a little bit, I've seen customer sales cycle take 6, 9, 12, and over 12 months. And why is that? Well, there's a lot of variability in the proposals that you're going to get. And I don't want to go out and, and commit to a $25,000 system or $30,000 or $35,000 system if I need uh, my production needs are greater without doing some comparative shopping, right? So I'm going to call in some proposals. I'm going to call two, three, four, six vendors, depending on my tolerance for ambiguity and complexity. <laughs> and I'm going to get all these uh, uh, proposals in front of me. And guess what? They're not apples to apples. Uh -uh. You've got different panels. You've got different output panels. You've got different appearance panels. You've got different inverters. You've got different designs. You've got different installation. Uh, you've got different wiring, you've got inside outside wiring, you have all kinds of considerate warranty that I told you about, different warranties. Now you're sitting there, I'm sitting there trying to piece these all together through the church. Risa and I and others were sitting there and we're going, oh my god, it took a committee of six or eight people with spreadsheets like three or four months to figure this out. So for an individual it can take a lot of time. The estimate itself, um, the vendor would then normally, um, once you select the vendor that you want to deal with, they would uh, look at your aerial view of your home, and we're going to see some of those in the next slide or two. They ask for your utility bill because they want to know how much electricity you use. And then what they'll do is they're going to try to maximize the utilization of your roof space where trees aren't blocking solar access, where another house isn't blocking solar access, to put as many panels on as possible to meet your utility bill. An ideal installation, an ideal design for a solar system would be to meet around 105, between 105 and 110 percent 
of your uh, utilization needs. And that's because that's the maximum that NYSERDA will allow, and it will on average allow you to be a net zero electric consumer over the year. Now, as we, as we look at um, your utilization, it's got peaks and valleys depending on your air conditioning heating needs. Most of your production is gonna be in what season? Solar, right. As a matter of fact, in a, in a nicely, optimally designed system, you're gonna overproduce in the summer, you're gonna send the overproduction back to national grid, remember in that two-directional meter, who's gonna store it for you, who's gonna give you credit for it, and in the winter months and night, et cetera, you're gonna draw electricity off of national grid for no cost, because that you've given national grid the electricity, and they're gonna give you a credit back. So that's what the vendor's gonna be doing up here, and then they're going to give you the proposal, which is their view of the world, their, their model, their panels and inverters. Um, once you accept that contract and sign it, then they will um, put together the application for NYSERDA for your rebate. They will work with the town, the permitting authority, which we'll hear more about um, later in terms of meeting all the local permitting requirements. In this case, you, you have uh, the homeowners association approvals needed. Um, and then National Grid will install a two-way meter. This could actually you know, vary. Sometimes they'll do it after the installation, sometimes before. Um, recently I heard that they're, they're, they have a great response time in getting that in. The system's installed, it's tested by the vendor to make sure it's working well. Um, and then you turn it on and you're, and you're in production. So that's kind of a once through on the steps necessary to get a system installed. So here's a view of an aerial view of Walton Fields. Um, and this is a high level view. If, uh, if I knew that we were gonna install solar on Reese's house down here, then I would have zoomed in a little bit more so I could see that. But let's look at a couple characteristics of solar installations that apply no matter where you wanna go. So what orientation do you want your solar panels? South. South. It turns out south plus or minus 15 degrees is fine. You're going to have hardly any decrement in your solar um, power output. Plus or minus 15 degrees of due solar south. So let, we just look at some of these um, south pointing roofs. This is the one I love most um, in Walden Fields. <laughs> You've got a, an open one there. Is that person here? Yes. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> you hate or love solar. You don't know yet. Okay. So, but I, I love that because um, it's clear and it's almost due south facing and there's no trees or anything around it. If we look at some of the other south orientations, we have, see some up here, but there's dormers and things sticking off the roof. And anything causes shading on any part of a panel, there's a, there's a penalty to be paid. Now, literally, at least in um, some of the older um, the standard systems, not the micro inverters, but the central inverter, if uh, that's my panel on the roof, and I'm a branch, and I, I, I put a leaf you know, on any part of this panel, the output from the entire panel gets decremented from 20 to 40, maybe even 60%, depending on the manufacturer and the actual physical construction of that panel. They're very sensitive to shading. So anytime you see dormers or chimneys or um, any kind of piping sticking up here, you're gonna get hit. So I see some of that here. You could probably get some um, panels there. Um, you got some panels that are like southeast um, facing west. You can do more than 15 degrees off of due south, but you're gonna have a decrement in the solar output. Now Serta will say that they'll fund a system for you. They'll give you that rebate. I believe that the expected um, power output is 80% of the uh, exposure to the solar irradiation at that point in time. So in other words, if you can only get, you wouldn't put it in a shaded area or a greatly shaded area and only have a design capacity for 50% because my server wouldn't fund it. Um, we have some other south facing roofs here. Here's a great south facing roof with uh, no obstructions apparently, but you're really close to the tree line there. So I'm not sure during all periods of the year just what effect that tree line might have. So what would I do? What would these solar vendors have? They have this neat nifty cane tool called the Pathfinder. So the Pathfinder, um, you see, is has a convex top 
And inside, which you can't see from there, is a gradient representing each month and each hour of the day. And so what we do is we place it on the roof and we orient it towards solar south. And in it, because it's kind of glassy and uh, convex, we see shadows. As a matter of fact, I can see your shadows now. But if we were actually on the roof, what, we would, what shadows would we see? The trees. The trees. And any obstructions, any other buildings. So I would put it right there, and I would get my camera, and I would take a picture of the, that convex output of the Pathfinder and bring that back to the office and run it through a computer program, and it would tell me the expected solar radiation available at that site every month of the year, every hour of the day. And it's on that basis that we submit the application to NYSERDA, and they see whether or not there's 80% of power output from that particular position or not. Let's look at Shadwick Square. So one of the things we notice, oh wait a minute, back here. So other than that, we've got some north-south facing, um, and, and they may or may not be viable for solar depending on the output from the Pathfinder. Some looks like, that, you know, this is like a northeast slope, which you now that's anything like north is not gonna work. You might find some south facing. There might be enough there to put a few solar panels on it or not. One of the things we see, I see here in Shadwick Square is there's a lot more south facing roofs. However, um, they seem to be irregular. Um, you know, with um, juts in, juts out, dormers, and other things. So, and there's also trees to the south of uh, these roofs. And the trees might be small now, but one has to take into account what kind of trees are they? Are they gonna grow into 50, 75, 90 feet trees in the foreseeable future and cut off your solar radiation um, or not? Or are they smaller um, trees by their genetics? We also see a sidebar of north-south facing. Um, they right away, by definition, they're less likely, they definitely won't have the same potential for solar uh, production as a south facing roof. Could you put some on there that aren't um, um, uh, um, uh, influenced by trees? The Pathfinder would tell us on a site by site basis. So let's talk about risks and, and concerns. The top one on the list here I've already mentioned, but I, I kind of like, can't overemphasize it. There really is a fire hazard here. Um, and your mitigation that I'll mention later also is to use NAPSEP certified installers. So the way you do that, NAPSEP remembers the North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners, which confirmed that I know how to spell seller in their solar in their test. But they're also on the NYSERDA website, you'll see a list of NYSERDA authorized vendors, and in, within that list of authorized solar vendors, you'll know which vendors are NAPSEP certified. So you want to use those to re try to reduce your risk here and only have solar systems that have a, a quality design and installation. Um, the next uh, risk is glare. Um, we've seen, some people have seen photos on the website that in fact if you get at the right angle um, to like a solar array that the sun will actually bounce off of it and, and into your field of view, obscuring or you know, causing a sun reflection. I've even heard a report that uh, an airplane pilot you know, got a reflection off of some solar panels. Um, so it is possible, and, and it seems, I have never experienced it in the field and my daily work, so I think that there'd be a mitigation around that too, and we can talk about that later. I, I, I don't wanna say it doesn't exist, but it doesn't seem to be a, a high, um, a high chance risk, although something that we could design in the installations if you wanted to pursue it. Roof age is important. As a matter of fact, roof age is very important. Um, generally, you don't want to install a solar system on a roof which is greater than about five years old. Um, and, and one can see why, that you don't want to be in a position, and you want to minimize the chances of being in a position of needing to replace your roof because it's old and leaking while after you have solar panels on it, because then you have to take the solar panels off, put this, um, replace your roof, and then and, um, put your solar panels back on. So if a, if a vendor sees, the vendor will ask the age of your roof. If it's over five years old, he'd likely recommend 
that you put a new roof on before. The good thing is that most likely, that there's certainly a chance, I, I think it's safe to say most likely, that you can include the cost of a new south-facing roof in the cost of your solar project that NYSERDA would approve for rebate. So uh, they wouldn't, if you have to do both the north and south facing roofs, of course they're not gonna include the cost of the north facing roof and the cost of your solar system. But on the, on the roof orientation where your solar panels will be, I have heard that NYSERDA will cover that cost of the new roof in your, in your um, actually incentive and rebate amounts. Uh, let's see what's next. So here we, oh, this is, uh, this is probably the most fun part. We're gonna look at some um, photos now of, well, okay, good, aesthetically pleasing, what most people would say installations, and then some of the bad and the ugly, which actually are more fun to look at. Um, so here's, uh, again, the good, what solar panels can look like on a house. So you notice that there, this is the array. Remember that the cells are the individual black boxes in there. Here's a panel, here's a string, and all the strings together are an array. So you know it's nicely squared in there, um, looks neat, etc. Here's one on a, more of an inner city home um, where there wasn't the side that set back from the edge of the roof. Some rec some municipalities will have setbacks requirements from the edge of the roof. We'll hear more about that later for the town of Bethlehem. Um, here's another one over the garage uh, where there's no setback, nicely filled in, nice and neat. Um, here you can see there is a setback requirement. It looks like about three feet or so on each of the edges of the roof. And that's, um, again, that municipality saw fit to um, have that setback probably to enable <coughs> fire fighters and people to get access to the roof. Ah, whiskey does it every time. <laughs> uh, whoopsie, did I jump the head? Another nice, neat <coughs> installation. Here's that uh, photo where I said I snuck in some solar thermal panels. You can see the difference in the solar thermal panels in the middle and then surrounded by the solar photovoltaic panels. But they're all symmetrical, it's neat um, installation. Here's another one. <clears throat> another different kind of roof, it looks like a metal roof with a setback requirement. Now here's the fun stuff, the bad and the ugly. You notice it didn't happen around here. This is Provo, Utah. <coughs> so uh, what do you notice here? Um, first of all, you got all of these cable runs that are bringing the output from the panels right on the roof. Instead of going through inside and, and under the attic um, or out of sight, they're actually having the combiner boxes up here and the metal wiring and various dimensions all around it. What, what do you notice here? <laughs> They're raised, why are they raised? Catch the sun. Better access to the sun, right? So ideally, the, the access, the angle to the sun should be your latitude, wherever you are. So in this part of the world, we're what, 44 degrees latitude or something. So our solar panels should be solar south, 44 degrees, in order to get optimum output from our solar um, uh, panels and arrays. And that's what they were trying to do here by raising that angle. Now, if you don't have quite the um, um, angle of latitude, similar to the plus and minus 15 degrees, your, your output's gonna be only incrementally reduced, decremented, but not significantly. But what, what do you notice? I mean, how does that look? The most, you like that? Would you want that on your house? How about on your comfort? So, so most people would say that that might not be um, suitable for them. What do you see here? This is this has so many examples, it's one of my most fun ones. Okay, well, maybe it's not a fair question if you can't see from back there. But one of the things is, look right there. You have two kinds of panels on the same house. You see the difference between upper ones and the lower ones? So that's like a big no-no. Whoever did this is like, you know, they need to go back to school. One of the things you never want to do is combine panel manufacturers in the same installation. But it'll actually reduce the efficiency of the entire system. So you don't mix and match. You have the same panel throughout. So that's one thing. Um, they also, uh, 
you know, there, there's something sticking out of the roof there, like uh, pipes and whatever generally can be moved from one location of the roof to another to avoid this. Now look at what's happening here. All of these cables, these runs, these metal runs coming on the outside of the house, and these different junction boxes here, and they're right next to a blotted out preschool uh, box where kids are gonna be. So you really have to pay attention again, not only to the, the um, output, I think my power is coming out, the output here on the roof, but also the associated cabling. Um, what, what's, what do you see here? Mess. Yes. This, this is going above the roof line. Well, I'm talking about wanting to optimize space. I'm, I'm, I'm actually going above your roof. Not all bad from an efficiency perspective, but you want that. Now look at this. Oh. Ah. Look, look, look at the edge here. And it's going over here above. And look at the odd combinations. Things are you're not in line. You've got a little panel stuck over here. And then look at that. Oh, this is one of my favorite. Look, look, look. Look at this. They've installed panels underneath the eaves, so they're all in shape. How much power do you think they're producing? Um, so now the, the part of the narrative under this photo was that before they, these panels were installed, the appraised value of this house was a million dollars. What do you think the appraised value is now? Half a million. Right. So there you go. It's so one example of. And by the way, we're going to get more specifics around the appraised values, impact of solar. Um, but you know, I just wanted to hit you with these first. Ooh, isn't that pretty? Look, look at, you know, more pipes sticking up. Um, and then different shades. Look, they still have these frames are different than these down here. Uh, oh, how many people want that? We'll take a vote here. Um, we won't comment on all of these. Um, here's more, uh, you know, the pipes collecting water, different angles. Um, the collector boxes on the roof, as well as pipes significantly affecting the output. Oh, look at this, look at this. Isn't that beautiful? Right off the edge here. I'm sure you're getting ideas for what you want on your uh, townhouses now. <coughs> um, here's, look at these different angles here. So you got some flat mounted and some of the different angles, yummy. Um, oh, that's a pretty one. More pretty ones, different angles. So you can see kind of helter skelter now. I'm including this as a reminder that we're not only talking about solar panels, but you really want to understand where and how your inverters and your wiring, your piping, is going to be collected. Um, because they can also affect um, you know, the aesthetics as you go into your house. Some people say that you'll want to actually approve the design before it's installed so that you don't come home one day and be surprised. So let's talk about uh, risks and conserve real estate value. I understand that some people might have one or two questions. Uh, so it turns out that as I was doing my homework and preparing, that there are no official real estate industry studies of the impact of solar on real estate values in this part of the country, in Albany, New York. So I got some answers for you, but it's not official. These two are more official. <laughs> So this is from Denver um, in October of last year. And I've highlighted, I, I, I put all the words up there even though there are too many words for a PowerPoint, just so you can see the direct quote, but I highlighted the salient points. Increase the market value and almost always decrease the marketing time for single family homes in Denver. Um, here is a study in San Diego and Sacramento a couple years ago. And it adds between three and four percent of the value to a home. Okay, so that's for that part of the world. What about this part of the world? So what I did is I it really took about six or, or eight phone calls. You know, I called realtor, I called realtor associations, I called friends, I called contacts, and finally I got a guy who's both an appraiser of homes and a realtor in the Albany area. And I have some input from him. He did not want his name here because he didn't know who was going to be looking or how good a job I was going to do. Um, but if people have you know, discreet questions or want to talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, he said I could give you his name and phone number you know, one-to-one -one afterwards, and I'm not broadcasting it uh, right now to everybody. 
But here's the formative reference to formative stage. He said, we are in a formative stage in the solar in the capital districts with not enough solar scales to establish value. Solar is not yet the norm. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, well, gosh, there's no definitive answer. But it gets back to my congratulating you for holding this meeting because you're helping to establish the norm and, and what's to be expected in, your, in relationship to your values. And then he said it can have an adverse um, reaction by individuals depending on the exact solar installation, the configuration. Well, we saw some pictures where I imagine if most of us wanted to buy that house, we would probably bid less or walk away from it, um, depending on the nature of the solar install on the house. Here he says, the uh, quality of the roof mounted installations would be expected to increase value of a home, especially in a homeowner's association. Huh? I thought he added that, I didn't, I didn't, even, I didn't even cue him on that. Um, if many homes had the same appearance. Now keep that in mind if you would please, because on next steps I'm gonna suggest something that if you wanted within the homeowners association context, you could actually leverage that significantly to your financial and aesthetic benefit. Um, he, he will generally, this is the appraiser part of his work, would generally add $10,000 of value for a $15,000 system. The actual impact on the sale can vary between customers. And he says, he always will say that because you know you might like something different than I would, than you would. And so there's always the individual customer to customer reaction. But in general, that's the value he would add $10,000 to a $15,000 system. Homes without solar will sell for market value. In other words, so if you have a solar system on your house and um, your neighbor does not, then uh, I asked him what the effect on, on your neighbor's value would be. And he said if the neighbor's house without solar would sell for market value, and he equated it to have, um, uh, what's, what's, what are some of the um, more desirable countertops in the kitchen? You know? yeah. So, yeah. Something that's, uh, better marble. yeah, better marble, something that's you know, added in one house that another house doesn't have. The house with the better um, kitchen countertops will get an, uh, uh, an added value for that in the marketplace, but the house without that kitchen countertop um, would still sell for its market value. Similar to sales price of a home with upgrades compared to the base model, in his words. Uh, similar to value of base model car compared to those with more accessories. So you know, if I get a car with lots of accessories on it, the appraised value of that's gonna be higher than a base model car. Well, those are both the market values uh, depending on the features we have. I'm continuing with the same source here, the appraiser realtor. Um, a January 24th, uh, January 2014 conversation. There's probably a generation variance. Okay, I thought that was interesting. So what did he mean by that? He said, probably grandparents being less comfortable with solar energy and younger parents being more comfortable. And here's something that really stood out in my conversation with them. It is likely that our children will grow to expect solar on their homes as we go forward into the future. It doesn't negate the fact that any individual, you know, I'm, I'm in a, uh, probably the more grandparent age might be less comfortable, but in general, that's what he's seeing. Solar will become more the norm in the intermediate future. A direct quote, I would rather be ahead of the curve than behind it. And then with regard to the effect of leased systems, leased systems on home sales, remember how you get zero dollars down and all the benefits of leased systems? You're signing a contract for 15 to 20 years. If you wanted to sell your house before that solar lease was up, um, I asked him if there might be any complications due to that scenario, and he thought um, home buyers must qualify to assume the lease. So, in other words, whoever is interested in buying your house would also have to qualify to take over that lease. If they can't qualify, then you'll be forced to pay off the lease in a lump sum, and you'll have to disclose to your solar lease obligation when you sell your home. That wasn't his quote. That was from the uh, uh, internet search. His quote was down here. He thought that local realtor appraisal estimates that this will generally be not be a problem requiring maybe 10 more minutes and the total amount of paperwork required during the course of the lease. Whoa. That being said, you can go to the internet and find you know, almost horror stories 
and, and probably true in that particular case, where leases um, held up or caused dramatic um, upsets in the uh, selling of a house. So this is one of those areas of formative stage and risk and you know things not being crystal clear. It's possible that leases apparently can cause problems. Our expert local here said he wouldn't anticipate more than 10 minutes worth of extra paperwork. So the truth is in there someplace. Mm -hmm. um, let's go to other uh, risks and concerns. R the roofing structure. Now by design, our rafters and whatever, especially here in this part of the world, are designed to incorporate significant snow loads. And the solar panels are just a fraction, a fraction, I actually forgot the numbers, uh, but a fraction of the total uh, load capacity of our roofs, along with snow. So there's basically on a well-designed, well-implemented roof with trusses, et cetera, and rafters, there's no concern putting solar panels on. Now why I say, you need to have the, um, it should be assessed by the vendor who's putting them on, is they actually should go up into your attic, your roof space, look at the rafters, make sure there's no, uh, you know, um, degradation of the wood by ants or fungus or, or for some reason the builder didn't install it correctly, you know, so there's some risk involved there. If there is, you can still put um, solar panels on there most likely by adding um, additional reinforcement to the rafters in order to build their capacity, but it should be assessed. Um, unique considerations for uh, contiguous roofs like you would have in your homeowners associations. Well, I mentioned uh, obstructions here, the dormers and chimneys, any obstruction on a roof that will cause shading, uh, could cause degradation in your power output. The fact now that you have contiguous roofs leads me to believe that there might be a possibility where a roof, a chimney on your neighbor's roof might in fact cause shading on your own roof, which would reduce the power output there. Um, I'll leave the Slayer setback requirements to uh, Vincent? Justin. Justin, sorry. To Justin from the town, because for example, if there were three foot setback requirements from every edge of your roof, um, I want to understand what that means in terms of the roof being contiguous, if there'd still be a three foot setback on the demarcation or not. Um, tree preservation and planting. I mentioned the fact that, you know, if there's trees that are existent, well, if the trees that are there, our, our pathfinder would find it, and if they cause too much obstruction and shading, you simply couldn't put solar on your house. But if there are trees that are going to grow into your uh, solar space, as it will, that could cause problems. In some communities, they're actually developing ordinances um, called, I think, solar access rights. Um, not here to the best of my knowledge, maybe uh, we'll hear more about that later, but some, in some communities they're saying if I put a solar system on and I anticipate solar coming from that south-southwest direction, you basically as my neighbor can't plant a tree over there. So I guess we don't have to be concerned about it now. Um, so that's a good thing, one thing we don't have to be concerned about, yay. Um, some folks are concerned about e-waste. <laughs> Um, so in other words, toxins that are involved in the production of solar panels. Well, it turns out that there are toxins involved. And different panels have different amounts of toxins. And different toxins, different panels are created and manufactured in different countries. And different countries have different environmental regulations. So you have all kinds of combinations of concerns here depending on your priority. Here's a source, there might be other sources. Um, this is, I put it up here, um, the solarscoreboard.com um, 2013 report, solar photovoltaics. Um, <laughs> what they're doing is they're listing every single solar panel manufacturer. This is only the top five. I think they go on for like five pages you now, 500 uh, panels. And they rate these according to different criteria. And right off the top, I can see I don't know what all of them mean. Anybody know what EPR means? Okay, so they're rating them by EPR, by emissions, by chemical reduction, by worker rights, by supply chains, conflict minerals. Anybody know what, everybody know what conflict minerals are? <laughs> so, so our cell phones and electronic gadgets are many times made, I think most often made, with minerals that come from only a small area of our world, specific areas of the world. And too much of the time, some people would say, 
Those areas of the world, like the Central African Republic are, and the Congo, are war torn. So, whatever we buy, those uh, minerals from that area, we're actually contributing to warlords, which contributes to um, wars in those areas. So, they actually track these conflict minerals, toxicity, C to C uh, recycling, prison labor, biodiversity, energy, and greenhouse gases and water, and they give them a score. And so if you want, if this stuff is important to you, and it is to some and it's not to others, you can go to sites like this or others and know that they were there. However, at this point in time, they're 50% more expensive and uh, much less productive um, in terms of output, um, so they're not really viable. Solar paint. Solar paint's being developed. So instead of painting your house, uh, normally you paint it with solar paint in the future. Um, and it produces uh, solar for you. Right now, um, the efficiency of these is like 1%. The efficiency of a standard solar panel now is like 10 to 15%, probably more like 15 to 17%. And sun power, which is one of the more efficient brands, is like 22% or so. So that gives you an idea of how this isn't quite viable yet, um, but things are developing all the time. Possible mitigating strategies, we're coming to the end now. Um, I mentioned using NYSERDA authorized vendors and NABSEP certified vendors at the beginning, so you want to, you, you might want to consider that if you want to talk to vendors and screen them. And in addition, they're just talking to neighbors or references. If you know people that have worked in this area before and had a good quality um, output, um, buy quality products and um, gauge this by the warranty. So when you look at the specifications for your uh, panels, for example, or your um, inverters, look at the look at the spec sheets in detail. In particular, I'm going to mention warranty and add two other dimensions of a warranty. The 25-year warranty again is a power output warranty. Every solar panel, every year will decrement in its designed solar output. Every year it will produce a little bit less electricity than it did the year before. The more expensive quality panels, that slope will decrease. It might go from 85 or 90 percent to 75 or 80 percent at the end of 25 years. For the cheaper quality panels, you might start off with 80 or 85 percent power output and go to 70%, 65 to 75% power output. So that power production curve will change. You want to know what that is, and that's what your power warranty is for. Now, this frame itself, you know, what's around it? What's holding it together? The glass, the wiring inside. Most pan manufacturers warranty their actual product itself for 10 or 15 years. Um, after that, um, the warranty is up. So if the frame cracks, etc., um, it's not warranty. Now I want to add a caveat right away. It's very unlikely. I mean, there's basically no moving parts in the panel itself. So it's unlikely that something will go wrong. But if it did, after 15 years, it wouldn't be a warranty. And the last dimension of a possible warranty is the maintenance replacement. So if something happened to your panel, you have to take it off your roof, you have to get a new one, you have to put the new one on your roof. Almost all vendors won't, won't warranty that one day. So if anything happens to that system, um, you're responsible for taking it off the roof. In other words, hiring somebody to do it, buying a new one, putting it on. Very few um, uh, will have a, a, that dimension covered. One that I know of will have that uh, maintenance replacement covered for, for the full 25 years. Um, so there's three dimensions of a warranty, the power output, the structure itself, and the replacement. And so you might want to uh, uh, pay attention to those. Reese, do you have something? Yeah, just that on the leased system. Um, can everybody hear you? You can't pull it in. Yeah. On a leased system, all of that, if, if you've got a good lease, would be covered. Cool. Thank you for that clarification. That's one of the benefits of, of leasing, the monitoring, et cetera. Uh, let's come over here. So possible benefits of solar. We've been really focusing on risks and things that could go wrong. Um, but let's balance that a little bit with uh, some possible benefits. Again, certainly not all benefits apply to everybody. Some might not have any of these benefits, depending on your situation. But let's look at some possible ones. Um, saving money and mitigating against rising utility prices. 
Now this can be tricky because I've seen studies on the internet that go back to utility uh, price increases, say for the past 20 years or more, and they say, wait a minute, hold everything. The, the um, cost of electricity adjusted for inflation has gone down. You're paying less now than you were 20 years ago. So how might that differ for the next 20 years from the last 20 years? Well, one of the things that we can see that it's likely to be different, well, one of the things, two or three things that are likely to be different is one, coal uh, power plants are, used, are often and more and more quickly now coming to end of life. So that a lot of the turbines and generators, et cetera, that are in our current central coal-fired power plants are literally older than me, like 50, 60 years old. Um, uh, Edison would recognize them if he came into a power plant now. They're strong, they're doing their job, they're doing wonderful things. Don't, you know, I'm not knocking them, but they're coming into end of life. So central power stations, be they nuclear or coal, are being shut down. So you're having less generating capacity. Number one, our population is increasing, so the demand is going up. Number three, our, tip, our costs for typical fuels, which are oil and coal and natural gas, are going up. So you're having less generating stations with higher cost fuel. All of those things are pointing in the direction of a rising cost of utility prices. And let's bring it home right away. What's happened to your utility bill since January or so? Anybody know? I've heard of like 200%. That the rates have doubled. Now, of course, I don't know, you know everybody's situation. But sometimes people are coming to me and they're absolutely shocked by what's happening. Now, of course, this could be in part temporary seasonal fluctuations, you know, given winter supplies. But in general, it seems to be an indication of the rising utility prices. The fact that solar is a, really an endless supply of energy, and so as we consider it, um, it reduces greenhouse gases. It's generally more environmentally friendly. But, you know, this is not clear, right? All in, it's not black and white. You have the toxics that are involved in the manufacture, so you have to consider that as well. And in general, I've heard that the energy that it takes to create um, a solar panel, you know, the materials, the metals, the uh, electricity to actually create it, and the greenhouse, the environmental impacts caused by that is generally paid back. There's a payback of about five to eight years. So after that panel's in use five to eight years, you're saving greenhouse gases, electricity, environmental impacts over the, compared to continuing to use um, uh, utility provided fuel. And we, we said remember it's practical anywhere um, in the United States, it's even in the Arctic Circle. Um, generally, there's evidence to say that there's increased values of real estate, but is that true all the time? Uh -huh. You could have, you know, depending on the situations, the uh, impact could be negative. Increased value of inheritance. We didn't talk about that yet, and that's perhaps a little bit more tenuous. But in fact, um, some people, some customers are like 60, 70, 80 years old, and we're talking about a lifespan of, remember, warranty life of 25 years, expected life of 40 years, and people are saying, wait, wait, one, six, eight. that doesn't add up. So what's going on here? Well, they're seeing that they're pulling their money out of current, some of the current investment tools that we have that aren't producing very much and putting them in, investing them in solar systems because the anticipated savings given the increased utility rates and fuel rates is higher than the rates that they would likely to get in their investment. And in addition, uh, part of the potential impacts around real estate, say that an older person, I'm focusing on older now because on the surface it seems to be more incongruous, but it would apply to anybody, is if you're investing in a mechanism on your house to reduce future expenses, future electric rates, then you or a prospective buyer looking at your house says, oh, well, I won't have to pay $300 a month for your electricity on your home. Therefore, I can take that $300 and put it into a higher value house and therefore pass on more value and inheritance to my descendants, et cetera, going forward. So that's kind of the brief story behind increased value of inheritance. Uh, customers are growing exponentially. I, I uh, left, when did I give that talk? Tuesday, Wednesday at the Honest Weight Food Co-op. I had three people 
from a brand new solar company that just moved into Albany that's going to have their grand opening on April 11th. They moved here from Arizona, I believe. And they are planning for a, a blitz in terms of solar sales in this area. Many solar vendors are looking and anticipating and experiencing increased values. So this is on the upswing um, by several um, measures. Distributed energy is more reliable and higher quality. I mentioned, um, we won't get into this too much, there's a lot of like engineering and architectural, electrical architecture design, but there's a, a certain redundancy and resiliency and dependency based on hundreds or thousands of small distributed power systems like solar systems or wind systems, etc., that can supplement the dependency of central power systems over time, especially the utilities really do need to integrate something called smart grid, or basically, you know, computer enhanced management of the utility grid. Um, but once that happens, and they're supplemented with these many hundreds and thousands of small power plants, like solar on our houses, the overall grid is gonna be more reliable. Um, have electricity during storms and power outages. I'm glad I put that up there, remind myself. It's really important to understand if you have a solar on your house, a typical installation, that when the grid goes down, you know, through some kind of uh, disruption, you know, storm or whatever, you're not gonna have power in your home. You're gonna be producing it on your roof and you won't have any power in the home as long as that grid is down. Now, why is that? Um, when the grid is down, it's likely that there's gonna be linemen <coughs> working on the grid in your neighborhood trying to figure out where the disruption is and repair it. So they don't want particularly electricity fed from your solar system going back into the distribution lines and getting electrocuted. I can understand that. Um, so all of the inverters are actually designed so when they sense that there's a disruption in the uh, distribution system in your house, they'll shut down your solar system right away. You won't get any power. Now there's a couple ways around that. Um, there are now inverters only introduced in the last six months that will actually allow a sub-circuit um, to feed electricity back into your house for core essential needs that you have. So that's a special kind of inverter, which again, might be part of your uh, proposal or interest with if and when you go out to solicit bids. The other and more costly uh, design is a battery backup system. And I think is that the last? Become independent, so these are kind of related. There are some people that come to us and say, I just, I just want to be done with National Grid, who they've uh, um, named AKA National Greed. I just heard the other day. Uh, or even if they're not upset with the cost of National Grid, maybe they're up in that, um, you know, Adirondacks, they're a half quarter of a mile off of the grid, it would cost them 20 or $30,000 for National Grid uh, to run a line to their house. So it behooves them to use a battery system. If you put batteries on, you design the system appropriately, this, grid can come down, you don't care. Um, those batteries are gonna feed your, your household needs, so you won't know the difference. You're roughly doubling the cost of that solar system, so most people don't do that, especially if they're within um, you know, national grid uh, range here. So next steps. Now this is me, this is me brainstorming. I'm within a couple of sections, I think one more page, and then we'll go to questions. But this is me brainstorming, trying to put myself in your position as two homeowners associations. So take this for what it's worth, um, and perhaps it'll uh, be a source, at least in part, for some discussion. So you all might want to take back some, uh, have some discussions on values. So we've covered a lot of materials here. This is going to be on tape and accessible to folks who aren't here. Um, this spreadsheet, this uh, PowerPoint can be made available too. You can look at these things, be reminded, look at your notes and say, as a homeowners association, what's valuable to us? You know, in terms of aesthetics, we, we have common needs. I think we can see now from maintaining a value of real estate. Given the current mitigation risk with design of solar systems and the cost of solar systems, is there a way to mitigate that to everyone's satisfaction? Have that discussion, you know, on a heart-to-heart -heart basis and really see what's important and see if you can reach a consensus. And then, um, you know, come to a, a, a the decision whether or not solar is going to be allowed, and if it is, now here's a cool idea. I'm really excited about this. I'm going to jump up and down. So, what, what's the possibility here? I think 
of if a homeowners association wants to consider solar for that organization as a whole to go out to local solar vendors and say we Chadwick Square are interested in solar for our community we want proposals from you in terms of what a cost for and then maybe people can put their name you know not everybody's interested but say 20 people are or 50 people are so what would you vendors bid for us to put a system on our houses for 50 people and right away you're gonna you're, you're likely to experience two things you should experience a price discount basically a bulk purchasing discount because you're coming to that vendor and you're saying vendor you don't have to market to all of us individually and when it comes and when and if it comes to installation you don't have to travel you know 30 miles between installation jobs you can do all of that work right here the benefit to you is you not only get a reduced cost of your system but you can control the aesthetics you can ensure you know, this is me not being a homeowners association but I assume that you could all come to agreement on the design, for example, the color, the size, the make, the, the type of inverter, so that everyone that has solar would have the same kind of solar, the look and feel. So you could support one another, the look would be consistent, and it might meet your HOA needs that way. Um, here's a look and feel benefits of bulk purchasing. Oh, I covered it all with my back to the screen. I'm impressed. Um, so, and then, well, I'll, you know, other ideas I think leads right into uh, questions. Uh, so that's once through here. Be glad to take questions. Reese, would you want to take it? You're all welcome. Come up, address your questions. Do we have uh, fire folks here? Yes. Oh, there you are. We have a seat table for you. So uh, if you have a question, come to the microphone. Ask your question, please. If you have gas heat, gas washer and dryer, gas stove, does it make still make sense to have solar panels? It would be what, just lighting, television, computer? Um, right now, in terms of cost basis, gas is hard to compete with. Yeah. Um, a couple of reactions I've heard to that is some people say they want to go solar regardless of the low gas cost because more and more of our gas is coming from track sources and they don't want that environmental impact. On a cost basis, um, you've got a big cost advantage there. The other thing is um, that what the vendor would do is take a look at your utility bill and see how much you are using and only put enough solar capacity on to address that need. So say you have a very minimal electrical usage now uh, maybe it's you know half of 5 kW or less um, they would only put maybe instead of 20 panels on to satisfy the entire need maybe they would put five panels on your cost would be dramatically lower but you could probably design a system on a limited roof space to totally um, meet your need and therefore on a net zero basis over the year not pay national grid any yep. yes ma'am now at the beginning of your talk you mentioned twenty thousand dollars is that for one panel if you had three panels or two panels would it be forty thousand or sixty thousand uh, yes thanks for clarifying that um, the, the reference to the numbers of panels wasn't there so that reference is to uh, a, a system an array that would supply about five thousand kilowatt hours for the year a system like that would probably be around 20 or 25 panels on your roof. So that $20,000 system would be for an array of about 20 or 25 panels on your roof. Um, if you double the number of panels for some reason um, on a larger installation, you wouldn't quite double the expense because you know you wouldn't double or triple the number of inverters and other balance of system costs. But it would go up in a relatively direct uh, okay, thank you. Yes, thank you for clarifying that. Hi, Steve. I'm Steve Castleman from Castleman Electric and Castleman Solar. Oh, great. I know you Good talked time. a bit about uh, NAPSEP personnel, but I think there's important, uh, there's something to be said about hiring the right electrician and making sure your solar installer has a reputable and licensed electrician as well to make sure it's a safe and clean installation. 
Would you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. I'm glad you brought up that distinction because we, we need uh, all of these installations have a lot of internal wiring that go through the house and connect with the existing um, utility system for the house. So we absolutely, we need a certified, a licensed electrician. And a reputable one. We all took your name. <laughs> um, to add into that uh, part of the permitting process, uh, we require a third party electrical inspector to sign off on all the electrical work. So, right. Which helps us in our inspection process. But they need their final inspection sticker prior to us issuing the CFC. Yes, yeah, so I noticed on some of those more ugly installations that we saw, a lot of them would be. Um, electric code, they would pass those exceptions, but they're not what you want. Um, you don't want kids being able to access. Oh, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to add anything else? Um, I can essentially describe the permitting process in the town of Bethlehem for solar panels. If one was to... Louder, please. I'm sorry. This is better. better. Um, if one was to come to our office with an application for a solar uh, array, what we would do is we would take all that information in. We would also require the homeowner to hire an engineer, look at the roofing system, sign off that it can support the loads that will come with the additional solar panels, um, and essentially you know, approve the permit from there. But if you live in a community where there's a homeowners association, we would also require a letter from the homeowners association approving the installation before we can issue the permit. That's the process. You want to mention something about the uh, side setbacks that are, might be coming up? Yes. Uh, building code, there's not a whole lot of building code right now for solar panel installation. It's very small, the requirements. Um, I've been to a number of classes that indicate in the near future, probably the next year, there will be setback requirements from roof edge gutters essentially etc um, of three feet that is not official by any means I'm I'm bound to um, stay within the code for now so if somebody were to come in with an application that showed the panels going all the way to the edge of the roof I would have to approve it but uh, like I said in the near future hard to say when I would assume in the next 12 months there will be a, a three-foot setback uh, requirement even on contiguous roofs? That has yet to be seen. I don't know what how it's going to be worded. Um, I could see that happening too because on the contiguous roof, a lot of times with townhomes, that separation is your property line. That is the, is the line. So it, it all depends how the state words the code. Our uh, local Mr. Chad. I was Chadwick Square, and um, I, you know, you're the town, and our roofs are mostly 24 inch on center, the rafters. Everything that I have read is 16, so we'd have to have all kinds of work done on our roofs. I don't believe so, no. Um, okay. the, the way those are designed, we're probably a truss system, so essentially they were designed to be that way. 16 is typical in construction as well, but that's why we would, the homeowner is responsible to hire an engineer, sometimes the company supply their own engineers too, um, to take a look at the roof and, and tell us that it can hold the load. Okay. But 24 is normal. 24 is cold, it was cold. Yes, yeah, it still is. But yeah. I have been reading up on solar energy and I think everything was based on 16. Right, and then both, both are typical. Okay. Hi, I'm John Oates from Chadwick. Uh, for Steve, uh, could you do a little more description of where the various components in a solar system are installed within or outside the house? What's the typical location for these various boxes that are now added to your system? All right, thanks um, for that opportunity. Typically, the a vendor, from an aesthetic point of view, will obviously put the panels on the outside of the roof. 
and then as quickly as possible, hopefully underneath the panels, drill small numbers of holes into the inside attic in order to combine wires together and then run those down inside the house into the basement through the least uh, we have no basement. No basement. No basement than wherever your current meter is. Um, and then outside. 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 Yeah, okay. outside the front doors. So then it's if it's outside, door. they snake the outside. wires. Again, hopefully inside the building and in the least aesthetically obtrusive way. It is possible that sometimes the best way is to run them outside. And then you'd have uh, choices about you know the color of the conduit, the shape of the conduit, where you want it run in order to minimize the impact. And then somewhere near the, your current meter, um, if you have a central inverter, you'd have another, the inverter would be close to your, your power meter now. Um, and that uh, inverter would probably be um, about the size, well maybe of an air conditioner, but stood up on end, depending on how big your system is. Um, and then of course remember that the uh, meter itself would be changed out by national grid but to you on the outside it wouldn't look any different so really you're talking about wiring which is going to be try to be um, aesthetically hidden the best of possible you want to know that as a homeowners association and agree on you know how the vendors should do that generally and then you have uh, an inverter next to your power meter unless you have micro inverters um, which would be another design where you wouldn't have another a big box. You might have some uh, connector boxes, et cetera, but they should largely be invisible. Where would the other meter be? Um, there's only one meter. Um, your current sure. meter from National Grid. Let's see. I wonder if I can circle all the way back. I think he means the production meter. Production meter. Oh, that. Um, I think I came way out of it. Um, again, this should be uh, someplace that is least obtrusive. Um, if you had a basement, it would be there. Sometimes I've seen them that it might be incorporated into a, a monitoring panel, like a, a, a display panel, so that that's your means of monitoring the output, and in which case, you could actually feature that in your living room. Um, so it looks nice, it's designed to be you know, on the wall, kind of like a, a fancy, uh, fully functioned um, a heating and air conditioning control device. So it depends on what your vendors are going to offer. Does that answer your question? It doesn't quite look like it. Well, I'm just concerned about where exactly they'd be located, the size and the shape. It's not a real meter. It's more of a communications device. Please, please stand up to the microphone so they can. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It's not. It's not a real meter in the traditional sense, like your electric meter. It's more of a communications device that just allows you to monitor how much you're producing over the internet. Yeah, it's just like where to be located. That's all. Anywhere in your house, really. Anywhere you, you want. There's no code for it, so the communications meter. Um, another uh, point for Steve. I had another question. Um, Before you do that, let me just answer this next question. Uh, another, another example Another example I can cite is it on? Yes. Yeah. 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 Is uh, in North Bethlehem on Eden. Uh, they're they're uh, homes that are kind of like the homeowners here in the room, uh, they share a wall, share a room. Um, the gentleman there had solar who wanted to show it to me. His, his production meter was in the garage. So he opened up the garage and, and everything came from the roof down into his garage and you know the whole <coughs> system there that could all be in the garage. It was all in the garage. Now, the, I don't think the utility was, there, but all the stuff you know, that Steve was talking about associated with the solar was right there in the garage. He was very proud. He wanted to show me how much energy he could save and how much money. He, he was really wanting to talk to me. So it was always located near your circuit box. Your circuit box. Oh, yeah, correct. Um, question for you. Um, a question for you, Steve. Yeah. I'm not sure if you touched on it in your presentation. I didn't see, but oftentimes penetrating the roof with the supports will void your roof warranty. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just wanted to confirm with you the importance of using a UL listed roof penetration product, making sure your solar installer, you know, um, warranties his penetrations mm -hmm. and uses a quality waterproofing product as well. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Actually, I, I just read an industry study that said that most roof installers love for solar uh, vendor uh, companies to come along and punch a couple hundred holes in their roof. Um, 
So no, it makes a big difference on the installation mechanism, the racking, because some are clearly um, superior in terms of reducing and mitigating the risk of um, water penetration, which is a risk I should have put up there. Um, anytime you put you know some kind of hole in your roof, be it plumbing, venting, whatever it might be, there's a there's a risk, and, and there are ways to mitigate that with a, a qualified uh, vendor. Steve, how, how many holes in the roof? <laughs> how many per panel? How many holes? In the roof? Uh, well, it's not just per panel because underneath the panel there's racking that basically. Um, one penetration of a, of a rack might be over here, and then another, you know, 10 feet down there, there'd be another penetration of six or eight holes, and then there's um, racks between those, and these silver panels are mounted to those cross racks. So I think I've heard that, you know, it can be, uh, depending on the size, you know, 100 or more holes in the roof. So it's really important to have, um, you know, the quality uh, mounting infrastructure. What was your name again? Steve Castle. How could I forget Steve? <laughs> and Steve mentioned. Thank you, Steve. Yes, Steve. <laughs> Another Steve. <laughs> uh, just a clarification and a question. Uh, I have a south, due south facing rear roof oh. in Chadwick Square. I went through the whole process with an engineer uh, checking out my roof, all the way up to the town permitting process, and it stopped right there. But uh, my five kilowatt uh, voltaic system was going to have 17 solar panels, not 24 or 25. Uh, just wanted to mention that. Uh, question is for the fire department. Uh, there have been some questions from people about uh, how the fire department feels about solar panels and any possible impact on firefighters. Hi, thanks for having me. My name is Jim Reagan. I'm chief of the Ellsbury Fire District, which covers the areas of Chatham Square and the surrounding area. In the fire service, we're always faced with new challenges. Uh, this technology is emerging. Challenges in the building include things like uh, flammable fabrics, uh, carpets, the fire load put in the building, which is changing the way we fight fires, uh, in addition to things like terrorism, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, current topics, hazardous materials, those oil tank cars are a big hot topic right now. But fortunately, solar panels are something we have a good control over. Uh, we depend exclusively on the uh, permitting process, uh, the engineering, and the, ins and the electrical inspection follow-up uh, that's uh, required of the systems. We're fortunate we received extensive training on it, and uh, we know how the systems operate. In fact, last month we just had a drill about the whole subject. And uh, as far as I know, they seem very safe and reliable, and I don't know of any incidents that have been sparked by a solar panel installation. There was talk about the three-foot setback rule. I think that most recently came to light, I think there was a fire in Philadelphia, where the firefighters need to have access to the roof, so they just need a, basically a, a space to walk on the roof or to put their ladders on the roof. Um, and I think that's how that all came about. Uh, a lot of times, depending on the significance of the fire, we have to cut holes in the roof, but we wouldn't be cutting holes in your solar panels. Uh, there's, a, there's probably other spaces on the roof we could use to cut holes if we had to. Uh, if my house is on fire, please cut holes. As far as we're concerned, they seem to be very safe and effective, and uh, we rely on the town codes and installation inspection process. One question on that: <clears throat> When your your fire engines you arrive at a fire, and the house is on fire and it has solar panels, <clears throat> is there any additional time you have to take five minutes, ten minutes to determine something as to how that solar situation is connected that would delay the actual time it takes you to get to work on that fire? No, it'd be no different than the power from National Grid coming into your house, it's your, your system is energized, uh, we would assign one of our crew to locate the solar system, uh, the, the shutoff, the breakers. Uh, so we would de-energize as much of the systems we could. Likewise, we have to call National Grid to come out to remove the meter to de-energize the house. So it takes a long time for National Grid to come out and pull the meter off the house, but that doesn't, hamper, doesn't usually hamper our firefighting activities. 
Uh, we just have to respect that the current is there, and, and we treat every wire as if it was live. On solar installations, there's I think there's at least two places to disconnect. One is the uh, collector box breaker, I believe, and one is the inverter. It's the DC box. The DC, DC box. Yeah. Suppose there are batteries involved. <clears throat> okay, some of the older systems in town have battery backups, uh, and they're basically like car batteries in their house. A lot of people have went away from doing that because uh, the, the cost of the batteries, they only last like three or four years, and they don't get used that much. Same system, though, we would disconnect, you know, there's a lever, there's always a lever to disconnect the power to shut off the power like a circuit breaker in your house we would deactivate that but it really would slow us down as far as that wouldn't that be in the locked garage if you're going to put these things in the garage supposedly this thing you're going to have to disconnect uh, it depends on each installation uh, yeah, right it's, it's like a circuit pan, like your breaker panel in your house the same idea yeah, they're in this locked in the garage right use this, this new entire system 17 25 panels they're going to be they're going to be controlled from a panel that's going to be in the garage, which may presumably be locked. So you'd have to break through the garage door in order to disconnect it. We would locate it wherever it was, and we would and have to access it some way or another. Right. And and I'm sure they're well marked. When when they install these systems, they're marked specifically. Um, why as are part you of sure they're well marked? So I believe it's part of the code. Yeah. yeah. Even, even the conduit that runs down from the roof down has to be marked special. I noticed that you said you have you depend on the inspection, the engineers, the this, the that. There's things like about 15 different steps here, and you say I, uh, we are all dependent on all of that work that has been done um, ahead of time and during the installation, and then we, as a firefighter, come in depending on all these steps that have been done, and then we can do our job seems to me there's 15 different places or 15 different steps where people can drop the ball so that when you come in all of these things are oh, not in place. It's quite pot anything can happen. Right. And uh, so there's a lot of... Uh, it's the same as the building code itself. The building code requires right. that the studs be 16 on center. So you come in at the 16th step and say, okay, you know, it's okay. this well, is our fault. We have to adapt to a lot of This is our fault, right? right? We can adapt. And I'd be very interested to see that you poke a... a burst the hole in the, in the roof and be safeguarding the panels. You don't want to safeguard the panels that are least. Well, no, we wouldn't go near the panels because we understand that the panels are energized and we can't control the energy. We can't. No, you don't want to touch the least panels because you don't mind smashing a hole in my roof. No, no. My neighbor's roof. The, 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 the panels are energized. We have six units that are all contiguous. How many questions? Yeah. So I, I don't know who, who uh, oh, you, would say, you would respond to that. If I could, just referring to a question, Steve, you mentioned there are 17 panels rather than 25. Oh, there you are over there. So I just want to briefly um, note that the panel uh, the power output from each of these panels can vary significantly. So depending on which power output you get, you can have fewer number of panels to achieve the same level of power output. So I said 25 panels, he said 17. I buy more expensive panels than with higher power output. In other words, 345 watts per panel output rather than 245 watts per panel. I can have fewer number of panels on my house. The second one is with regard to fire, a lot of the, almost all the standards are governed by the National Electric Code, and the National Electric Code is in fact driven by nationwide fire organizations if I understand it, so it's all revolved around safety. And last thing with regard to the position of the um, off box, cutting the power off from the solar. In some installations, it's hard to find that power cutoff box. Um, so I'm not sure what the town code is, um, but w in the homeowners association requirements, if it's not obvious that that be perhaps, for example, on the outside marked clearly the solar panel shut off, you know, you could have that requirement in your installation. Well, maybe you've answered my question. Uh, imagine uh, um, a home that's uh, unoccupied for years that has a solar system. Uh, does that present any particular hazard? Nine years. From a fire perspective, the way the system operates, if this is exposed to sunlight, it's always energized. From from the panel down to 
the collector box, if you will, if there's a switch there. So that part of the pin is always considered to be electrified. You can't, the only way to shut it off is to physically cover it with a blanket, you know, uh, uh, something that doesn't let light in. And a variation of that answer, I think we're, uh, we, we do a good song and dance together, um, is if the house was actually unoccupied for a long period of time, the power of the panels still are producing power. So if one of the wires was to get loose and somehow short and create heat, or a squirrel build a nest under there and heat build up, there could be an increased uh, fire or other hazards. So what you might want to do is just close the system down. Shut it off um, with the shut off valve. Uh, maybe take it off the roof or cover it up with something so it's not producing. Or disconnect um, key wires and collector boxes so the voltage and the amp are just adding up and accumulating across the strings. Um, when we look at the size of this big panel, that's the only real panel here. This is just a sample of the other one. Yes. There's no, okay. So we're talking about possibly up to 17 panels that size on anybody's roof 17, in a town hall. 17, 20, 25, depending on what you buy and what your needs are. Okay. And all of those panels would have to face south to be effective. South plus or minus 15 degrees. And in Chadwick Square, we live in a, I call it a gridded community, north, south, east, or west. So anyone facing east and west would probably not qualify. Anyone facing north and south, if they face north, they'd be put on their back roof. But if they, if the odd side of the street faces, the front of our house faces south, you'd be looking to put them on the front of the house? Yes. Okay, just wanted to be clear on that. Yes. So, and so in a, in a neighborhood like ours, someone asked me to relay this question. What percentage of the homes in Chadwick Square do you estimate would qualify for um, solar panels? Oh, I, I haven't um, done that, but I think you, you could on your own, just by the ratio that you said, you know, divide, uh, take the number of north, south, facing versus east, west, ridges and use that as a ballpark unless you know you had a big group with big trees that you knew weren't going to qualify take that ratio and then it'd be your percent um, you know that's really high level you know to go to the next level they have to take an aerial view with some more detail and enumerate you know one by one you know which might fall into a viable category or which might not be. including trees yeah, trees are an obstruction, other houses, um, dormers, chimneys, anything like that. Okay. The, the answer is that 85, 85 units in Chadwick Square would be, are squarely facing east-west. 85 out of how many, please? 85 out of 210. So for the video recorder, 85 out of 210 units in Chadwick Square facing east-west. That's correct. Thank you. It's 212. 212. 212. Sorry, we want to get those other two. 212. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Steve, nobody has mentioned yet what the implications of all of this may be as to homeowners insurance. What happens to homeowners insurance, and what does your insurance agent think when these suddenly show up on your roof? Um, we actually had uh, within, I think, our study group, um, we have somebody approached their homeowners insurance and. And there is no impact. They're considered part of, they become part of the house and covered under your existing insurance. Does anyone have anything more to add to that? Reese, do you want to? Yeah, it was me, because I was doing this, and part of that was to contact my insurance agent. There is no additional cost to uh, having the panels on the roof. So that's that. The other part that hasn't been mentioned is there is no additional real estate tax assessment for when you add panels on your roof. This is often overlooked. You just, you just answered my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Reese, I'm not an expert in tax assessment, but if I understand correctly, the New York State law is for the first 15 years after a solar installation, there can be no an increase in the appraisal, the price value of the house because of the solar system. After 15 years, the panels aren't going to be worth that much anyway, so I don't think we have to worry. So, so Bethlehem Assessor said none. None. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, Steve, would you uh, like to mention the different colors that? Uh, that oh, thanks, Irene. Um, now, this this being represented, this panel being representative of a typical solar panel is basically by size. Um, in fact, panels come. The frames are can become in black, uh, basically. So it's a lighter color of black, and the actual um, cells themselves can come in significantly different variations. You can see that there's white. Um, around some of the edges here. Some of the panels won't have any of that. Some will be basically, if you looked at it, they would appear all to be black. You wouldn't even see the silver lines, you know, connecting the individual cells here. So there can be significant aesthetic differences in appearance in, in the panels themselves. And if that was something significant from an aesthetic perspective, um, basically some of the some of the panels could be totally black, and if you have a black roof, you notice them a lot less than something outlined in white or silver. Thanks for reminding me. Hi. Um, it seems to me, I think that, I might be right here, that as long as you're still connected to the National Grid electric system, you've got to pay a delivery charge. $17 a month. If you're not using any electricity. You don't, you don't have to use anything. Your minimum charge then goes to $17 a month. Thanks for clarifying that. And unless you literally disconnect, and, and then you live on batteries or whatever else, but again, yeah, that wouldn't be a cost-effective problem to have. Uh, a general question, are, are the town folks gonna to make some presentation, or are we just doing question and answer at this point? Basically, it's Q&A. Oh, okay, well, I have a question. <laughs> Um, you, you already know this stuff, but at least 15 states have passed laws that deny the right of homeowners associations to prevent the installation of solar panels in their neighborhoods. Some restrictions may be reasonably imposed, but outright denial may not. Do you know of the status of any legislation, either federal or state, that would bring similar restrictions to New York? I do not know of any. Has anybody looked into it? Yeah. Paul, what did you I had, um, I had just done some of that research initially, but I'm not aware of, I know I have been asked by a New York State legislator to forward that information, but given what's happening in the legislature with schools and everything else, I can't imagine it's high on anyone's agenda, but there are, through national websites, there's model legislation for states and two states that do have the the restriction does not what it does is it doesn't allow a homeowners association to deny homeowners from having solar but the homeowners association still has the ability to establish policies regarding aesthetics and trees and placement and everything so the homeowners association still retains that power to maintain their external aesthetics, but they can't deny it for no other reason. Um, two states that do have those laws are Massachusetts and New Jersey, so it isn't just in the Sun Belt. But I have, but I, and there have been bills before the U.S. Congress that have gotten through one house and not the other. But I have, I am not aware of, of anything that's moving nationally or statewide. I'm not aware of. I want one more, and it touches on what you talked about before, about hazard materials and the panels. And you said some companies are gonna replace a panel, they'll take care of the disposal. But in general, are there any town requirements on disposal of hazardous materials which would affect solar, the, the, uh, the getting rid of solar panels? The only answer I can give on that is there's nothing that uh, uh, points out solar as being treated any different. So if you have a heating oil tank, if you have a, a boiler, or if you have other appliances in your house that have hazardous chemicals, whether it's the CFCs in the refrigerator or whatever, you know, I'm guessing the solar panel would be treated the same way. That if, you, if you have an issue there, it, it needs to be handled appropriately. Um, I, I guess the point I'd like to make is that the issue that Steve was talking about was really the use of the hazardous materials in the manufacture and the waste in the manufacture.
manufacturing process. It's not like hazardous materials are dripping off your roof. If you put a solar collector up, it's you know it's the manufacturing process. Um, so the taking that off your roof, it's like a lot of other things that you take in and out of your house right now. If you drop it, if it breaks, you have glass, you have aluminum, you have paint, the same kinds of things you would typically have. Uh, but if, and, you know, so I guess the, the quick answer is that there's no legislation that says you do anything differently with a solar panel. Uh, you, you have to treat all of your uh, household appliances appropriately.
the transfer station you can collect it we take it to uh, you know I the recycler but if that if that turns out to be necessary with the panels it was the same, we would do the it same. Was the same with the television part of the cell phone I, I, I only brought it up because you know we would follow that same approach if if, if we needed to do something like we do with this. You do like hundreds of thousands of these panels on all these roofs and these, these communities, then it will become a significant factor. Right? The disposal. Right. right now, my understanding is from what Steve said, uh, some manufacturers have the the take back policy, which. To me, would be the nicest thing, especially yes. as yeah. a representative of the town. Wouldn't it be great if whatever manufacturers, same as leasing, right? Yeah. Maybe in the, you know, if, if the HOA says this is a requirement of, of some approach we take, as you alluded to, and you specify that, then that problem in your community, your immediate community, goes away. Now, yeah. Whether the town could legislate something like that, I'm not sure. I'd want to propose right. that. And the same as you know. Saying just lease it and all your power, all of your problems go away because we're going to shove all of the responsibility under the lease. Yeah. It's nice to say that though. the final analysis is the homeowner. That, that's the last thing. Actually, I think that's more true if you own it than if you have a lease. I, I think the liability is going to be different in two cases. That's kind of the detail. I don't want to even try to get into all of that right now. But you want the homeowners to get into it. The homeowners association to get into it. It's not usual. I think if you do anything as a group, you should you should make sure you do understand the liabilities involved. Yes. Yeah, right. Thank you. I might just ask you to elaborate a little bit on the safety of these panels themselves. Uh, uh, apparently, there's a space between them and the roof. What is it? A couple of inches or something? Okay. Now, what experience is there in this country, probably mostly down south, when the mega storm hits and you have really high winds? Do these things go flying off? Do they pull your roof? Do they pull your shingles? What what happens? Um, the National Electric Code (NEC) is very specific about the requirements for the installation of panels. So part of the calculation where NAPSEP um, uh, qualified vendors have to do is figure out how thick your roof is, how many layers of shingles is on it, what is the prevailing maximum winds in your area over the past 20 or 30 years according to the weather service, and what size lag bolt is needed to withstand those wind forces on your particular panels given the number of shingles on your roof given the type of wood, even the, if it's pine, or if it's southern pine, or if it's plywood, or whatever it is, that level of calculation to make sure they don't blow up. Other questions? I'm just the closer. Okay, I'm just the closer. <laughs> We wanted to thank everybody for coming today. I know it was a, a little longer than we even thought it was going to be.